please, please help me welcome the Honorable Justice Clint Bollock. Well, uh, good morning. It is such a pleasure to be here this morning. It's uh, a real pleasure to see so many of you. And uh, I, it's also really nice to return to uh, this particular building. I taught uh, con law here uh, last semester. And one of the things you may, uh, you may think to yourself, well, why are we having a Freedom Summit at a government law school. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I absolutely love about this magnificent building, and I, I have to tell you, I've been to dozens of law schools, and I think this is the nicest law school in, in the country. Um, this building was built without government funds. If you go around this building, you'll see all sorts of, you know, uh, well, you see it right here, the Auction Indian Community Conference Center. There's, there's uh, names all over this building of people who uh, actually paid essentially to, to build the room and put their name on it. Um, and I think that is just awesome. So when I walk around this building, I'm like, it's a magnificent building and I didn't pay for it. <laughs> that is just, uh, you know, a libertarian dream. Um, I uh, want to thank uh, Mark and his colleagues for, for sponsoring this. I hope this is the the first of, of many Arizona Freedom Summits. Um, this is, you know, I, I moved to Arizona in 2001 and I just love this state. You know, it's often said that, that people all over the world are Americans and they just didn't have the luck of being born here. I, that's how I feel about Arizona. I feel like I was in Arizona in my entire life and I finally got the good sense to move here in 2001 and for for those of us who are lucky enough to to live here i think that our obligation is to keep this the freest state in the country and to make an, an example throughout the entire world uh for freedom so i am so happy to be among people who are are working every single day of their lives using their minds and and their other resources uh, to, to keep uh, ours the, the, the freest state in the, in the entire world. Um, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I actually want to want to build a little bit on Mark's incredible remarks. I, I was unaware of what happened to, to Mark, and sitting here it just absolutely outraged me, as I'm sure it outraged each and every one of you. And uh, I never practiced criminal law uh, in my litigation career but since joining the Arizona Supreme Court a little over two years ago, uh, criminal cases are about half of the cases that I deal with. And I was a little worried initially. I'm like, I know nothing about criminal law. I thought the, the learning curve would be uh, quite steep. But it turns out when cases come to us, um, by the time they get to the Arizona Supreme Court, they are presenting either cr uh, constitutional issues or issues of statutory interpretation. And I have fallen in love with the criminal cases uh, in my court, and frankly, some of my favorite cases so far have been uh, criminal cases. In fact, my very first dissent uh, was in a criminal case. I'm not even sure that Mark uh, is aware of this, but it's emblematic of the story that, that he tells. It, it, it involved uh, a guy who was uh, down and out, uh, standing on a street corner, completely minding his own business when a car pulls up and the person inside the car says, um, hey, do you know where I can score some drugs? I'll give you 10 bucks. And the guy gets in the car and says, you know, I don't usually do this. You know, I feel kind of badly about it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do, be doing this uh, if you weren't uh, asking me to. And he leads him to uh, a transaction uh, and it turns out, you're probably already figuring this out, that the person asking him to do this is an undercover uh, police officer. And the, um, the defendant, a guy named Gray, um, tries to uh, raise an entrapment defense. And, and when you look at those facts, you know, that's within the reason. I wouldn't have done this. He even tells the cop in the car, I wouldn't have done this had you not solicited me. He didn't use quite those uh, sophisticated words. And it turns out under Arizona law, you can raise an entrapment defense so long as you plead guilty first. 
And I found that absolutely outrageous. And unfortunately, it was the only justice uh, who considered that to be absolutely outrageous. Uh, but I wrote a, a dissent saying that uh, uh, you should always be able to raise an entrapment defense. It's, a, it's, it's absolutely essential to our liberty to be able to uh, raise a defense of police misconduct and police enticement and giving up your right to defend yourself in a criminal uh, proceeding uh, by asserting your innocence as the price of raising an entrapment defense is, is, in my view, utterly unconstitutional. I'm happy to say that most of the cases, um, uh, most of the major criminal cases we've had, I have not been uh, in the dissent, and, and we've done some, uh, I think, some very, very important uh, criminal cases over the last couple of years. We were one of the first jurisdictions uh, to rule that a cell phone uh, is essentially a diary and that the police need a, a warrant in order to, uh, uh, to look at the contents of your cell phone. Uh, we've ruled that a person who is unconscious cannot have his or her blood drawn um, uh, without a warrant. We've held uh, most recently that a GPS device attached to someone's car uh, requires a warrant. Uh, so the, so I'm, I'm proud of my colleagues and I'm proud of my court, uh, but when, when Mark was telling his story, it, it reminded me, if a case gets to us, um, that means that case has been going on for years already and that the hell that Mark went through is something that, uh, uh, that, that someone has endured for years before they finally get to us. But I do take a lot of comfort out of the fact that there are multiple checkpoints in our system. However bad our system may be in individual cases, it's certainly better than almost any other uh, country in the world. Uh, and eventually, uh, even if it takes a while, as it did in Mark's case and as it takes in some of the cases that come up to my court, uh, at the end of the day, I'm confident that, that justice will be done. But it does require the kind of vigilance um, that, that Mark was talking about. And I have to say, and, and uh, normally one speaker doesn't ask for a round of applause for another one, but, but we are so blessed to have Mark Victor in this state. So please. Uh, <laughs> join me. You know, I. Uh, Mark's comments were apropos of the fact that most of the people in this room know their constitutional rights, uh, which is not true of, of many of the people in this country, although the thing that I am most grateful uh, to Barack Obama for is that Barack Obama inspired more people to read the Constitution from beginning to end than any other person uh, uh, who has ever served as our president. And so people know, for example, if you're arrested, that you have certain constitutional rights. If the government tries to take your house uh, or your property, that you have certain constitutional rights. If, they, if the government tries to suppress your speech, that you have certain constitutional rights. But I find uh, that uh, no matter how informed people are, that they don't realize a fraction of their constitutional rights. And, and so I'm going to start by saying, Think about the United States Constitution and the rights it guarantees, the constraints on government power that it provides, and imagine a Constitution that went much, much further than the United States Constitution does. For example, imagine a Constitution under the United States Constitution, if you're a taxpayer and there is an illegal expenditure of public funds and you go to court to challenge that, what will happen? You'll get kicked out of, oh very good, you'll get kicked out of court because the taxpayers do not have standing to challenge violations of the Constitution. So imagine a Constitution that provides that taxpayers could go to court and sue to vindicate their rights as taxpayers. They don't have to go through the political process, they can actually sue the government to enjoin an unconstitutional expenditure of funds. You know that our United States Constitution has been construed to provide a protection of privacy. They've looked at you know, the Fifth Amendment and, and uh, the Ninth Amendment and so forth, and, 
And, and they have, uh, the, the Supreme Court has essentially determined that we have a very amorphous right to, to privacy. Imagine if our Constitution had an explicit protection of, private pro uh, of, of privacy that said something along the lines that no one shall be disturbed in his property or his affairs without authority of law. Imagine a provision of the Constitution that forbids monopolies, not private monopolies, but government monopolies. The government monopolies, the ones that are, are not formed by the market and are impenetrable <laughs> by the market. Imagine a constitution that would actually for forbid those. Imagine a constitution that would forbid the expenditure of public funds for gifts to private individuals, corporations, or associations. I mean, how many times does government give away funds, taxpayer funds, for economic development or a whole host of other reasons that, that basically uh, give a preference to one, one set of individuals over another? Imagine a constitution that explicitly forbade such gifts. Imagine a constitution that said, if you want to give a benefit to a particular individual, that this is the government, an individual or a city or, or some, just single somebody out for special treatment, you have to pass that as a standalone bill. It can't be sneaked into you know, the bridge to nowhere in, in a massive omnibus spending bill. It has to, a, a private or local bill has to pass on its own. It has to stand the light of day, the scrutiny of public opinion. It can't be sneaked in. No more of these earmarks. Imagine a constitution that said that. Imagine a constitution that went beyond the First Amendment in protecting freedom of speech, that not only restricted government's power, but provides to each and every individual the right to speak as they see fit being held responsible only for the consequences. No prior restraints. Imagine a constitution that went beyond the Second Amendment, that protected our right to keep and bear arms. You know, the United States Supreme Court, it was a five to four decision to recognize the individual right under the Second Amendment to keep and bear arms. Four justices think there is no such right Imagine if our Constitution provided an explicit protection of the individual's right to keep and bear arms. Imagine a Constitution that limited government debt. Oh my gosh, our entire country would implode <laughs> because it would be you know, utterly unconstitutional. But imagine, imagine if our Constitution had that. Imagine if our Constitution not only forbade eminent domain for, for private use, which it does, although the US Supreme Court, of course, has, has eviscerated that, but also said that we will not presume that the government's use of this property is actually for public use. We're gonna take, the courts will take an independent look at that, and if they conclude that it's not really for public use, they'll strike it down as an unconstitutional act. Imagine if our Constitution in, in the era of Obamacare protected the individual's right to control his or her medical uh, 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 activities and would forever be guaranteed the right to choose a doctor free from uh, and, and health insurance free from government coercion. Imagine a constitution, and, and you know, our United States Supreme Court has deadlocked over the issue of racial preferences, over and over again, upholding government's power to discriminate among uh, individuals based on, on their race or ethnicity, uh, including a, a very recent case. Imagine a constitution that completely forbids racial and ethnic preferences in government contracting, employment, and education. And imagine this, this one takes a, a little bit even more imagination. 
Imagine a provision that said to the citizens of Arizona, if you think that a use of your tax money by the federal government is unconstitutional, you can prevent a single dollar of that tax money from being used to implement that federal purpose. Imagine that. Guess what? Every single one of those dozen provisions is in the Constitution. It is in, they are in the Arizona Constitution. And for so many years, we have been trained to think of the Constitution as the source of the limits on government power and the protection of our individual rights, when in fact we have 51 constitutions. And every single state constitution is chock full of protections of individual rights and constraints on government power that we could only wish were part of the United States Constitution, but are not, and never will be, because of how hard it is to, uh, to amend the United States Constitution. And of course, the rights in our federal Constitution have been terribly eroded over the years in, in, in many instances. But we have, here in Arizona, and in every other state, not every state, of course, has all of these protections, Arizona may have more protections of individual rights than any other constitution, but it certainly has all of those dozen that I mentioned. And yet we, even we, as freedom fighters, can think of the Arizona constitution as an afterthought rather than as the primary constitutional source of our rights and the limits on government power. And so I am here to say that in the era of Obama, we needed to read the federal constitution. Let's make it our goal in the era of Trump to read our state constitution from beginning to end. Just like any other protections in any constitution, these protections mean nothing unless they are implemented. However, the opportunities are breathtaking. The opportunities are, 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 are essentially limitless. As part of our system of federalism, our courts are free to enforce these different provisions uh, to the full and, and maximum extent of, of their verbiage. And the US Supreme Court can do nothing to reverse those opinions that we make unless they violate the federal constitution or a valid federal law. So this is an incredibly important facet of federalism where our state can have protections that, do, that, that don't exist in the federal constitution and we can enforce them vigorously. There's another feature of this federalist system and that is many of the provisions in our state constitution mirror provisions in the federal constitution. And we are free to interpret those protections differently than the federal courts interpret the identical provisions in the federal constitution, but only in one direction. We can provide additional protections of individual liberty, but we cannot provide less protection of individual freedom. I call that the freedom ratchet because we can change those, we can interpret them differently but only in one direction and that is in the pro-freedom direction. Um, the United States Supreme Court I've mentioned uh, has in many instances uh, interpreted words in the federal constitution in ways uh, that I, I think defy uh, the plain meaning of the provisions of the US Constitution and we are not bound by those interpretations at all. One other feature of the Arizona Constitution and, and all other state constitutions that make it such an incredible freedom uh, opportunity is that the state constitutions are so much easier to amend than is the federal constitution. In fact, I'm proud to say that two of the provisions I mentioned to you, I authored and uh, the legislature put them on the ballot 
the voters approve them and they are now the part, part of the organic uh, law of our federal constitution. We need to examine those provisions and do what we can to, uh, to enforce them. But we're not doing that. Just to give you an example, I mentioned the provision that was recently added to our state constitution that allows our legislature or the people themselves to determine that a use of, of public funds by the federal government exceeds the constitutional powers of the federal government and if we make that determination, either at the ballot box or through our legislature, no Arizona public funds will be used to implement that. Now you may say, wait, I thought we fought a civil war over this and we, you know, we uh, established the proposition that you cannot nullify a law. It's not nullification of a law. It is simply the state's decision not to fund a federal enactment. And the U.S. Supreme Court has repeatedly, over and over again, said states cannot be coerced to fund federal uh, activities. They simply can't do it. It's one thing that, that uh, uh, is, is sacrosanct in U.S. Supreme Court law. That provision has been on the books now for several years. And guess how many times it's been used? Zero. None. It is a tool at the disposal of the people in the legislature. And maybe, maybe it's that the U.S. Uh, government is not engaging in any unconstitutional acts. Um, maybe that's why. But it is a tool. It is a freedom tool that is at, uh, uh, at the uh, use of, of, of the people of Arizona and has not been used. Similarly, and Mark and I have talked about this, Mike Kielski and I have talked about this, it is absolutely important in cases that come before the Arizona courts to argue and develop um, state constitutional arguments uh, in terms, whether it's in the criminal uh, justice context, whether it's in the private property rights context or, or whatever. Um, we recently had a case that uh, I mentioned to you involved uh, the use of a GPS device um, on a, a vehicle uh, without a warrant. And this uh, happened to be in the context of, of a commercial vehicle and the co-driver was prosecuted uh, for, uh, uh, for transporting illegal narcotics. And so uh, this case came before our court um, uh, raising the question of whether there was a, a warrant. And as I mentioned to you, uh, it was actually, I think, it was one of the very first, our court has recently been expanded to seven. It's one of the first four to three decisions, and, and a majority of my colleagues and I voted uh, that this did violate the Fourth Amendment, that there had to be a warrant. Uh, but five of my colleagues, uh, over the objection of the other two of us, uh, concluded that uh, this fell within the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule and as a result in this particular context the fact that there was a warrant would not uh, be consequential and so this guy was was prosecuted but this case was argued entirely under the fourth amendment and that as 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 those who have practiced criminal law in, the, in this uh, room can attest the fourth amendment is a total mess when you look at the Fourth Amendment, it doesn't look like a mess. It looks pretty pristine. But when you look at the U.S. Supreme Court decisions interpreting the Fourth Amendment, uh, it gets really, um, uh, really messy. And so, for example, uh, under the, in this case, we had to determine, first of all, is a car an effect under the Constitution? Fortunately, the, the courts have, have made clear that cars are effects. Um, is a GPS device a search? Well, uh, fortunately, the, the law is good there uh, as well and, and very strong there. But then we had to decide, based on U.S. Supreme Court precedent, is this uh, a reasonable search? And the first question we had to ask was, is this co-driver, uh, does he have an adequate possessory interest in the car in order to, to be entitled to Fourth Amendment protection? And under, under uh, U.S. Supreme Court precedent, we concluded that he did not. Um, whether this test is legitimate or not under the Fourth Amendment is a different question, a question that the U.S. Supreme Court has resolved. And then the other question we had to answer is, 
is there a reasonable expectation of privacy on the part of this co-driver in his car? And there, there it really gets uh, crazy and complicated because we are asked to determine whether this particular expectation of privacy is one that, and I am here essentially quoting the US Supreme Court, is one that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable. So we have to answer the question, are you prepared to recognize this privacy interest as a reasonable interest? That's how the Constitution, that's how the Fourth Amendment is interpreted. A bunch of judges asking themselves what society is prepared to do, prepared to do at this particular moment in time. I consider that to be entirely <laughs> illegitimate. I do not know, first of all, how a judge determines what society is prepared to do. Do you take a focus group? Do you come to a freedom summit and ask people to raise their hands? If, if so, I think we've probably got a, that reasonable expectation of privacy in this room anyway. It's crazy. It's, are we supposed to be in the polling business? Are we, uh, you know, how do we do that? But it's not so much the how, but the fact that we're doing it at all. What if today we decide that there's a reasonable expectation of privacy and tomorrow we change our minds? Does that mean that the Constitution was amended from one day to the next? No vote taken. We have a procedure for amending the Constitution the Constitu in, in the Constitution itself and obviously that has not been done. But it's, it's, rule, it's not the rule of law, it's the rule, it's the rule of judges and I certainly don't consider myself equipped to do that, but that's what we have to do under the Fourth Amendment. And in that case, that is exactly what we had to do. And there is one reason and one reason only that we had to do that. And that is that the lawyers did not argue that case under the Arizona Constitution. They mentioned it in passing, but they did not say, hey, we don't need to go down this rabbit hole. There's a privacy provision in the Arizona Constitution that says that people have a, an, a reasonable, or sorry, not even reasonable, that, uh, that people have a right to privacy uh, in, their, in, their, uh, in their homes and in their possessions. And it, is, it appears on its face to be categorical. We don't have to go down this rabbit hole that the US Supreme Court uh, uh, gave us. But we can't answer that question unless it's presented, unless the adversaries have a, have a chance to argue it. And, and I, I actually wrote a concurring opinion in that case, basically saying, if only the question in the Arizona Constitution had been presented to us, perhaps we could have had a far crisper uh, 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 decision in this case, one that could be far more enduring. Because you know, the US Supreme Court is gonna get this pretty much this exact same issue over the next couple of months. And if they go the other way, that pulls the, the rug right out from under our decision because it was based on the Fourth Amendment and they are the ultimate ar arbiters of the Fourth Amendment. Other states have made this decision based on their state constitutions. And it is so important for freedom advocates to raise state constitutional issues every single chance they get I want to finish up with an anecdote, and, and, and poor uh, uh, Mr. Kielski over there just heard this the other day, and some of you have heard me talk about this before, but to me it is a constant source of, of illustration and inspiration because it shows an example of where Arizona led and an area in which we are number one in the nation for protection of individual rights, and it involves the context of private property rights. All of you remember, surely, the incredibly infamous case involving Su Suzette Kilo and the city of New London, Connecticut, where uh, New London decided that this working class neighborhood would be so much better for the city if it was bulldozed and replaced by a Pfizer facility that wanted to expand. And so they used the power, the incredibly destructive power of eminent domain uh, to bulldoze this neighborhood, the shops, the homes, the little pink house 
that Suzette Kilo had lived in her entire adult life. And we all know what happened when that case went to the United States Supreme Court under the Fifth Amendment. Uh, the Fifth Amendment says as clear as day that private property may be taken for public use. Those words being very, very important uh, in the minds of the framers, public use. Now how could a use of this property by Pfizer Corporation be a public use? And, and a majority of the Supreme Court, Court over a passionate dissent by Sandra Day O'Connor said, this isn't a public use, this is a private use. It is exactly what the Fifth Amendment forbids. But unfortunately, five of her colleagues said, well, you know, it says, it says public use, but what it really means, what it really means and what we're gonna hold that it means is public benefit. Public benefit, just think of those words, you know, a little word change, right? Not so consequential. Anything can be construed to be a public benefit. And, and, and uh, Justice O'Connor said exactly that. Replacing a 7-Eleven with a Ritz-Carlton certainly could have a public benefit. Not so much for the 7-Eleven, right? But nonetheless, the, the US Supreme Court essentially amended the Constitution and made that uh, a much broader open-ended grant of, of, of tyrannical power uh, for the United States and, and in this case the local government. And so Suzette Kilo lost her house. The entire neighborhood was bulldozed and some of you probably know what happened. Nothing. Pfizer never built the plant. So if you go to New London, Connecticut right now, it is still bulldozed. There is nothing there. One of the, one of the worst episodes of, of recent American uh, jurisprudence. At the very same time that Mrs. Kilo was losing her little pink house in New London, Connecticut. A very similar fate was being visited upon a man named Randy Bailey, a guy who owns a company, a little business called Bailey's Brake Service in Mesa, Arizona. And Randy uh, inherited that business from his dad and it was his goal to leave that business uh, to his son as well. And not only Bailey's Brake Service, but a number of little homes, a number of, of uh, little businesses at the corner of Country Club in Maine and Mesa, Arizona. And the government in, in Mesa uh, was, was perhaps a little less grandiose uh, than the city of New London. They said, you know, we, we want to redevelop that corner. We think, gosh, that crummy little brake service there, wouldn't it be really, really beautiful and wonderful if we had a hardware store there instead. And so the government used the power of eminent domain and served notice on Randy Bailey that he needed to move um, and, uh, and they would give him uh, whatever compensation a, a, a court approved. And they couldn't understand, I, I, you know, this really as, 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 as a litigator, I frequently encountered this, the, the mindset of, of the bureaucrats, they couldn't, accept the notion that Randy did not want to move. That there was no price. They thought it's simply he's trying to drive up, he's trying to fleece the taxpayers of, of Mesa uh, by raising his price. And like, just tell us the number. And our response was, there is no number. He wants to continue selling brakes in this building, in this spot. And we went to court and we lost in the trial court. Uh, the trial court saying essentially what the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately went on to say. And then we, when we appealed to the, to the Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals unanimously ruled that under the Arizona Constitution, there has to be a public use for any use of eminent domain. And as a result, Randy uh, and his neighbors won that. And it didn't stop there. This case so inflamed and inspired people in Arizona that they went on to adopt a law called the Private Property Rights Protection Act that is now by far the most expansive protection of private property rights in the entire United States. It not only prohibits the use of eminent domain for, for private use, it, pro it prohibits regulatory takings where the government reduces the value of your, uh, of your land um, and, 
basically considers that to be uh, a taking as well. There is no other state in the country that has those kinds of protections. And it came yeah. because our Constitution provides these additional protections and the people of Arizona decided that they wanted even more. So I'm happy to say, now as a justice, I'm no longer allowed to make commercial advertisements or endorsements, but I will just say as a matter of fact, that if you happen to be driving in Mesa, you push that brake pedal and doesn't respond the way you'd like it to, you can go to Bailey's Brake Service at the corner of Country Club in Maine and get brakes any day of the week. That shows the potential of freedom in this state. But as you know, the attacks on our most basic rights are omnipresent. They happen every single day. We cannot unilaterally disarm ourselves. We must use every tool at our disposal. We have so many of them available to us. What it requires is imagination, creativity, knowledge, and the kind of commitment that Mark and so many of the rest of you exhibit every day of your lives. I took an oath not only to uphold the United States Constitution, but the Arizona Constitution as well, and I am very proud of that oath. And I hope whenever I'm done at this job, whether it's uh, this year if the, if the voters uh, knock me out, or, uh, or 10 years when I face uh, mandatory retirement, that you'll look and say, you know what, Clint? You vindicated that oath. If so, I'll be very, very proud. Thank you very much. And I think I, I think I left some time for questions. Yes, you did. Okay, cool. So I I will give uh, a former client's privilege to Mr. Roy Miller. <laughs> Are there Um, so, uh, th such cases have not yet gotten to us. There have been a few instances where a friend of the court will make these arguments at the very end of the day, so I know that, um, that some people have been paying attention. Um, uh, but that's too, that's too late, essentially. If you haven't raised them and developed them, then, then we're going to consider those arguments waived. Um, so I am told by my criminal defendant uh, lawyer friends uh, that this is now part of the training program, at least for criminal defense lawyers, and that they are making this argument over and over again. It's not like you have to you know, write a law review article. You simply have to aggressively assert it. And uh, so I am hoping that those cases will begin uh, percolating up. And then, of course, organizations like the Goldwater Institute and the Institute for Justice do make those arguments, um, you know, on a, on a daily basis. I have been recused uh, from a number of the Goldwater Institute uh, cases. I probably no longer will be recused because none of those cases are cases that I was involved with or, or was there when, uh, when those cases was, were developed. Um, so I am hoping to see more and more of those cases. And, and Roy, there is not a single public forum, I don't care who I am talking to, where I don't mention this, so I'm really hoping to get the word out. Asik. Great speech, thank you. Thank you. I have a question about, um, the, uh, about legislation, uh, local legislation which might set a standard for beauty. This is something that is uh, becoming very popular in European cities. I know it is in Austria. It just started to be a legislation in the city of Wrocław, southwestern Poland. So basically, the city sets a standard of beauty uh, for certain areas. Telling oh, I thought you were talking uh, about people. <laughs> <laughs> That is maybe the next step. Okay. <laughs> they say, for example, you cannot, if you have a building in, 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 in the center of the city, you cannot advertise because there's too many colors. Or you cannot have ugly, sh I mean, 
they, they set their own standard. According to their standard, it cannot look like this. It must look like that. Um, I, th I find it quite dangerous for liberty and, um, and property rights. Is, but my question is about the Arizona laws. Would um, such kind of legislation be um, legal under Arizona Constitution? If, 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 for example, city of Tempe or Phoenix start to determine if you can have or not advertisement of your building or certain colors and so on. So I can't, I can't express my views on that. Um, judges have restrictions on their freedom of speech rights. Um, <laughs> but uh, I will say that uh, the Institute for Justice took a case in, I think it, all, yeah, it was also Mesa, um, involving a Winchell's donut shop and uh, the city of, of Mesa uh, basically prescribed the precise sign, sizes of signs you can have in your, in your windows. And it turns out that um, uh, they were not the standard Winchell's advertising uh, sizes. And as a result, they had to spend lots of, ma of money to, to come up with different advertisements for their windows. And this was uh, challenged by IJ unsuccessfully. And one of the doctrines of the, uh, under the US Constitution is that, and, and probably all of you know this, commercial speech receives less protection under the US Constitution than political speech and other types of speech. Um, so constraints on, on commercial uh, speech and, and advertising are, are more permissible. When I read the language of the First Amendment, it's hard to see that in there, but nonetheless, it's pretty well established. I don't recall whether that was also argued under the Arizona Constitution. I think it was. And I think, I don't think that case went up to the Arizona uh, Supreme Court. Um, but our uh, provision uh, protecting speech, as I mentioned, is more, um, uh, it's, it's broader than the First Amendment. And our court has held that it is broader, but it hasn't defined what that means. Uh, and, and basically, our provision says, any person has the right to freely speak or publish being responsible for the abuse of that right. So um, I think that there is room there to make um, arguments um, that the Arizona Constitution, you know, as I said, it's already been established that it is broader, uh, but those contours haven't been, haven't been filled. One of the nifty things about being Arizona is that our constitution is the third youngest constitution in the United States. And as a result, uh, there's a tremendous amount of, of opportunity to develop areas of the law that haven't been developed. And certainly the free speech area uh, is one that, uh, uh, that lends itself uh, to, to those kinds of arguments. How they would come out, um, uh, is is something that I, I can't I am not allowed to to project. Mr. Friedman. Yeah, could that same donut case be argued not on free speech grounds at all, but on the regulatory grounds? Uh, so you're saying that under the Arizona Constitution, a regulation that reduces the value of my property counts as a taking. That regulation reduces <coughs> the value of the property. Wouldn't that be a possible line of argument? I, it would certainly be a possible line of argument. I believe that that particular case predated uh, the uh, additional statutory protections, but uh, you know, conceptually, I think it, it, it definitely uh, would lend itself to that. I was wondering why, when you look at court case law, you always look at other judges what they rule. An example would be Wickard versus Spilburn, which uh, Supreme Courts have used to dramatically increase the Commerce Clause and the Federal Constitution and so forth. At what point do we get a reset where you disregard all that? Well, <laughs> thank you so much for asking that question. Um, and I'll give you a concrete case in which I disagreed to some extent with my, with my colleagues. And this, I think, reflects my own
personal brand of, of jurisprudence, which, I, which reflects uh, the school of thought uh, textualism that was developed by Justice Scalia and I think adhered to by Justice Thomas to a large extent. And, and I'm seeing very positive signs, uh, Justice Gorsuch as well. But we had a case uh, that will interest a lot of the people in this room um, that some of you may have followed, and it uh, involved a city ordinance um, by the city of Tucson um, that uh, basically provided that any guns that would be confiscated by the city of Tucson would be destroyed. And Tucson is a charter city. We have two types of cities under our constitution, charter cities which have additional powers and uh, non-charter cities which only have those powers that are given to them by the state. So the state passed a law saying that cities can't confiscate, um, uh, or sorry, that they can't destroy confiscated guns. So there was a clash between the uh, city of Tucson law and the state law. And so this case came to us and it turns out that since the 1950s, there's been a doctrine um, uh, that the Supreme Court adopted that looks at these cases and says, is this a statewide issue or is it an issue of purely local concern? And if it's a statewide issue, the state law will prevail. And if it's a city issue, um, a, prime, uh, a purely local issue, then the city ordinance will prevail. So my colleagues and I applied that doctrine and we ruled happily, to, in my mind, unanimously that uh, the city of Tucson law would yield, would have to yield to the state law because this was a matter of statewide concern. In part, I argued that uh, because um, our constitution protects the right to, to keep and bear arms. However, when I looked at the actual language of the constitution, I saw something very interesting and it said that charter laws are, and I am quoting here, subject to the laws of the state, as clear and categorical as that. Which in my mind, and I wrote this in a concurring opinion, means that they always are subject to the laws of the state. Now, sometimes I won't like that. Um, sometimes I will see a local law that I personally like and a state law that, that dis differs with that. But the Constitution says that charter laws are subject to the laws of the state. And so it turns out that this test that the court had been applying for now, what, 70, close to 70 years, came out of <laughs> thin air. And so I wrote, and, and so it, it, what you just said that re, re triggered this response was that courts typically, when they're interpreting the Constitution, the first thing they do is to look at other cases that they have decided to see how they interpreted that. My mode of analysis is to look at the Constitution first. And if the Constitution differs from our precedents, there's no doubt in my mind which one of them prevails. I do not take a, an oath to the doctrine of stare decisis. I take an oath to the Constitution. Our job is to align our decisions to the Constitution not to align the Constitution to our decisions. And in that case, it didn't have a significant difference in the outcome. But in other cases, I can't, I can, it kills me to think of how much money has been spent litigating those kinds of issues because of this test, this amorphous test that, uh, that we put into place before I was born. Um, when in reality, the Constitution is not ambiguous, it is quite clear. And that is the type of, of analysis that I think all ju judges and justices um, uh, ought to employ. And that is you begin with the text of the Constitution or the statute. And if that text is clear, that is the end of your analysis. Yes, hey. Uh, we hear all these new justices are being elected. Uh, are you optimistic about freedom with the new ju uh, judiciary system changing, or should we be pessimistic? And here, here, uh, you know, we we could be talking about two two things. One is here in Arizona, mm -hmm. and uh, one is at at the federal level. 
Um, here in Arizona, uh, Governor Ducey has put more personal investment into the selection of judges than any governor I've ever seen in any state anywhere. Um, and I could go on and on about this, but just to tell you what his interviews are like. You go in, and I was one of the first people to be interviewed as a, as a judge uh, by Governor Ducey. And he gives you, you know, the normal pleasantries, big smile, and he says, I have 45 questions I'd like to ask and get as many of them answered as possible. And it is just, I mean, they're exactly the kinds of questions you would want asked of people like, um, uh, what, uh, what is the more important uh, part of the religion clause of the First Amendment? Uh, what's the worst decision in the last 25 years and why? Who's your favorite justice and why? What book is sitting on your bookshelf right now? You know, and on and on and on, really probing your judicial philosophy. And I found that very exhilarating and very, very excited. Um, uh, Governor Ducey's uh, picks have been very, very diverse. Um, in, in, in every uh, sense of the word, uh, but I think that he's, he's picking people who are, who have a, uh, I, I think, a, a very sound philosophy of judging. With regard to the federal judiciary, I have not examined many of the, I, I happen to know some of them. Um, some of you may know my very dear friend, uh, Don Willett, uh, justice on the uh, Texas Supreme Court, um, who is now on the Fifth Circuit. I think Don, Don was an amazing Texas Supreme Court Justice, and I think he will be fantastic on the Fifth Circuit. But the, the one person that uh, gives me the most hope is Neil Gorsuch. And when uh, Gorsuch uh, was nominated, I read about two dozen of his opinions. And I was so excited um, reading these things. I mean, they're mostly nerdy and boring things. But the process that I described to you, where you start with the text of the Constitution or the statute and you end there if it's clear, he did that every single time. And some of you are familiar with the Chevron Doctrine, where, um, where the courts defer not just to the legislature, but to bureaucratic agencies that are unelected and they engage in extreme deference. Um, and he took that on in such a brilliant and principled way that it, it made me want to stand up and cheer. In fact, I've already been able to cite that opinion in one of, one of my opinions. Um, so I am very excited about Justice Gorsuch. Uh, just based on that small sample size, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with, uh, with what I'm seeing at the federal level. And I think, do we have one real short possibility left? Okay, yes. I had a thought. What if uh, attorneys at the very beginning of any case just put a supplemental brief saying and attach the Arizona Constitution to the back of it saying, we argue all these points to the fullest extent that we can on top of their other brief, or the supplemental brief? Well, you know, so long as they raise it early on, I don't think how they raise it matters all that much, but they, they just have to. What you typically see is, this violates the First Amendment and Article Two, Section, you know, whatever. Um, and there's no independent analysis whatsoever. Um, but so long as it's it's robust, uh, then 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 we're going to consider it. And um, I have spent now countless hours encouraging that. And I, I, I as I mentioned to. Uh, 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 to Roy, um, I'm, I'm hoping it bears fruit in the not too distant future. Thank you so much and, and go get it.